Hey guys, welcome to a new video. So now that the theoretical ZFS video is finished, I am finally ready to move over all the disks from the old server to the new server. And we'll do that in two ways. First, we'll send some data using ZFS send and receive because I don't want to lose any data, so it needs to go to the new server. And the second way is by actually physically moving the disks. So let's get to it. Okay, so the old server is down here. As you can see, it was uh, just a desktop chassis. And I actually put four times three hot swap bays inside of it. And well, these have been working great for six years, but I upgraded to a little bit better chassis now. Um, let's first take a look at the ZFS send receive part with which you can easily send ZFS data sets over the network to another server. Okay, to use ZFS send and receive, let's first see if there's a data set. I have my anime ZFS data set remaining. So let's first make a snapshot of that, and I'm calling the snapshot at down. Once the snapshot is done, and in ZFS that only takes a few seconds, we can then run a ZFS send and receive command. You basically run, run send locally, and then pipe it to SSH, to the remote host, and there you give it a zpool name and another dataset name. Now this dataset name needs to be new, but once you hit enter, well, that's it. You, you're now sending the snapshot over the network, and as we can see here, you see bursts of data being written to disk, because there's a gigabit connection in between the two hosts, and well, the local disks are faster than the network connection is. And then ZFS gathers writes, and basically only writes once every five seconds or something like that. Okay, the transfer is complete, so now let's destroy my uh, data set. Ah, it still has snapshots, so I have to use the minus R. And then let's destroy the whole zpool so I can use these disks in my other server without having too much issues. Okay, well, this server is now completely free of ZFS storage. Okay, so using ZFS send and receive makes it very easy to send data sets and backups and well, everything I discussed. Um, well, you can see the new server down there. I already have some drive base out. So let me turn off my old server now mount the disks in the new caddies, and then move over the LSI controller. I'll flash it first without any disks connected in the old server, just as convenient. And then I'll move everything to the new server, and then we'll take a look to import the old pool and create the new mirror pool, and maybe check out some speeds of moving some data around. Okay, and there you have it. Two times 10 terabytes, which I've already had for one to one and a half years, which are going to become part of the eight times 10 terabyte RAID Z pool mirror, as I explained in the last video, and then five times four terabyte. And well, I'm going to repurpose these and I'm going probably going to make a RAID Z2 or change the disk layout a little bit, but my current data is still on here, and it's currently a RAID Z1. So these, what was on here, I transferred to my current 2 terabyte pool, you again saw in a previous video, uh, over the network using ZFS send and receive. But I don't have enough space for that, so I'm first going to create the four or 8 times 10 terabyte pool with these, so then I have all 8 complete. And then I'm going to import these, this pool with the data 
move it to the mirror pool, and then I can repurpose these. So there's a little bit of planning involved, getting all the data where I want it and to be able to rearrange everything, but we'll get there. just saw me putting them all in the new bracket. One of the things I do is I put a little label on the front, which tells, uh, let me see if I can focus that. There we go. Which has, uh, well, basically which type of disc it is. This is a Seagate 10 terabyte. And then the four lost digit or numbers from the serial number. So I use a, uh, a brother wireless label printer for that. And that actually works really well. They're cheap and uh, you can get these uh, thermal labels and they have them in 12 millimeter size, which is well, the uh, width of that label or caddy. And well, I already did a few and then it looks like this. So because I'm also adding my disks in Linux or ZFS using disk by ID, if ever a disk fails, it always shows the serial number on the screen because then I can easily find, oh, it was 2074 or it was HQSH or where is my SSDs? Here are SSDs or I have uh, some SSDs connected over here. I can easily identify what is where from the outside. Takes a little bit of work when you're putting it all together. But in three or four years, you'll be really thankful if one of the disks failed or you want to replace something, you know exactly what to take out. So I do this using some uh, label software from Brother. It comes with the printer and it's just, uh, you know, easy. Just make a label like that. And as I said, the 12 millimeter size fits perfectly on the caddy. And uh, yeah, I can definitely recommend you do that. Okay, this is uh, my old server. And uh, as you can see, here are the uh, hot swap bays. I uh, replaced the fans a few years ago for uh, more silent ones. And they each have three SATA connections going to the LSI controller or uh, the onboard ports over there. Um, the good thing about these were that they had dual Molex input. So I used two power rails from the Seasonic power supply down here. It's an X series, so it was a gold power supply, I believe. Yeah. 80 plus gold. And well, that's been running straight 24 seven for six years. I really like Seasonic. So I'm going to get this uh, LSI card and then I'm going to mount it in the chassis. Okay, card is in the system and uh, cabling turned out very well as I hoped. But as you can see down here, uh, it's a bit of a cluster of cards. Now I have two ideas of how to fix that. Uh, one I'll discuss in a future video because I still need to do some testing on that. And the other is maybe mounting an, uh, an 80 millimeter fan right here to the chassis, which then blows in that direction, basically blowing the hot air up so it can get some circulation. But I'll, uh, I'll test those things in the future and probably make a video about it. I'll show you the chassis again better once I replace all the fans for Noctua, which I'm going to do sometime in the future. Uh, but for now, let's see if this thing boots. Okay, I have a ping set up because I literally only have power and net 10 gig network connected to it. So let's uh, turn it on. So some of the hard disks spin up immediately while turning it on. But I've noticed that the 10 terabyte Seagate Iron Wolves actually don't. And they only spin up when the weight controller activates them. Oh, there we go. Blinky, blinky. Oh, lots of blinkies. But that does mean the second LSI card is found, or at least I think it does. Okay, it's importing the 2TB pool. It's looking at all the other disks. So let's see if it pings. Hmm, it did. Interesting. Oh, there we go. Okay, hold on. Okay, it's pinging. So let's see if I can log in and import that pool from the other server. Okay, to import the pool, we're now on the new server. You basically just run a zpool import and that will show you uh, with the disks connected which pools might be there that you haven't imported yet.
Once you then wish to import it, you run a zpool import and then the pool name. Now I have some missing devices like the log devices. So I use a minus M to basically force it to import anyway. Now I didn't export the pool correctly on the old system. I kind of forgot. So I have to use a minus F to be able to import it. Then it says it kind of creates some shares. That's correct. Those are the NFS shares that were on there, but that's fine. So now you can see we have our RAID Z1 minus 4TB pool online and it's missing those log devices, but we can remove those later. As long as we can access the data, I'm okay. And well, that's looking good. Okay, let's uh, quickly remove those log devices. Okay, and now the pool is online and healthy. It does mention that the ZFS version on this system supports more features for a pool and those aren't enabled yet on this pool. But if you want to keep your pool transportable, uh, you might want to or not want to enable those. Since I'm going to move over the data and then destroy this pool, I don't need to upgrade right now. Okay, next we're going to create our new pool, which is going to be our mirror pool. I'm calling it HDD mirror. It's just the name I like to use for it. And then I'm using minus O shift 12 because these are advanced format disks. So have 4K sectors uh, underneath the 512 byte emulation layer. Basically, nowadays you should always use minus O A shift is 12 just to be sure. And then we're starting to create the mirrors. So I sh start with a mirror command. And then I look up on some photos how I put the disks in the system because I want one from the third row and one from the fifth row to form a pair. And well, I basically repeat that a few times. As I mentioned before, I'm using the slash def slash disk by ID. And that makes it very easy if there's an issue or something else to find the disk that is actually having that issue instead of SDG, SDF, SDA, etc. So we just repeat the mirror command and then two disks behind it a few times and then we hit enter. Okay, and there we go. New HDD mirror pool with four mirrors inside of one pool online. Okay, let's make sure compression is turned on on the pool level. And then let's make a snapshot of the whole RAID Z1 4 terabytes, which is now online in the new server. And then again, use ZFS send and receive, but now locally to send it to a new data set on the new HDD mirror pool. Okay, that's running. And as you can see, I'm seeing bursts of about 1.6 gigabytes per second. So that's looking great, but we'll dive into performance a little bit more uh, in a later video. Hmm, interesting. I was just about uh, to leave the room when I heard some clicking noises coming from some disks. And, um, well, let's quickly check on the console if one of the disks is having a problem or not. Okay, let's see if something's going on. With dmessage, you can often see recent system messages. And as you can see here, uh, it's reporting a critical media error. That's not good. So I'm glad the copy is running and the speed seems to be okay. Okay, so as you just saw, this upgrade or data migration shouldn't have become much later because, well, one of the WD greens is failing. Um, I'm currently copying, as you saw, and it's going with a few hundred megabytes a second. So I'm hoping to get all data off there and then, well, scrap that drive because it's five to six years old. But we went through... Um, transferring data over the network and then we did a local transfer like we're doing now and you can use ZFS send and receive or you can use some other method like just copying or rsync or whatever you like to use. Uh, we created the mirror pool and well this is where I'm going to leave this video. Uh, I guess you guys will find out in the next video if I was actually able to read all the data from that pool which has one sketchy disk in it. It is a RAID Z1, so even if it fails, I should still be able to continue reading the data. Okay, thank you for watching and uh, following my journey here, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.